Hey y'all, new day, new verses. We continue on into Isaiah. Today we are picking up at Isaiah 5, 6 and going to the end of the chapter. And before we get into it, Father God, just help us release this time to you. Help us release our, uh, everything to you, Lord God. Not just our lives and our moments, but the, the thoughts we held captive, the, 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 that we could just lay it before you. The things that we don't know how to bring forward, that we would just lay it before you, Lord God. The stuff we're, that we feel like we're too ashamed to bring forward, that you couldn't possibly love us through, Lord. Let it, let's lay it down, because you love us that much. You love us through it. <laughs> you just see us through, Lord God. Lord, help us chase after you as you chase after us. Help us love because you loved us first. Help us live a life set apart because you have set us apart first. Let our lives speak to the holy, holy, holy and worthy, worthy, worthy Lamb of God. Set us apart, dedicate us to and for you, Lord God, as we dedicate ourselves to and for you. Use us, Heavenly Father, every day, in every way. Heavenly Father, bring revival across this whole world, to every nation, to every city, to every peoples, that we would just cry out in triumphant praise and say, You are King. For, Lord, we know the way of this world is going to the grave, that it's disappearing, Lord God, that it will come to an end. Even if it doesn't happen now, Lord God, we know that that is the story of it. So help us focus not on the world that is passing away, and the when it will happen, let us more focus on the fact that you love us. That in relationship with you, we can love like you love us. That we can pour out grace like you pour it out on us. That we can really live. Teach us to live, Lord God. Learn us what it means to be your children. Peacemakers. To see with your eyes, to hear with your ears, to love with your heart. To truly be your hands and feet, for you are the head and we are the body. Lead us, Lord God, and as you bring forth revival, bring forth unity that we would show by the way we live to the world around us that you are different and have made us different because you are. And because when the mutable interacts with the immutable, the mutable must change and we are clay in your hands. So mold us in the shape, way, and put us on the path that you have us for us, Lord God, because you chose us for such a time and place as this chose us to be your own. So help us focus on those promises, focus on what it really means to be your child, to be your son or daughter, whomever is listening, that they hear you. This is Lord God, it was your sweet, small voice that called me your own. Do it in each one of us to remind us, to give us that Peter or Paul-like walk. It doesn't matter, Lord God. Just let us release it to you and get closer to you. Father God, help us not fall into temptation. Deliver us from evil, God. Deliver us from the evil one. Keep us mounted firmly on your rock. We need you, Lord God. We need your daily bread. We need your protection. We need your covering. We need your love. We need you. So, Father in heaven, come in. Send your Holy Spirit. May your will be done in our lives and on earth as it is in heaven. Make us yours, wholly and completely, that we may never look back and never want to. In Jesus' name, amen. Picking up at verse 6. I will make it a wild place where the vines are not pruned and the ground is not hoed, a place overgrown with briars and thorns. I will command the clouds to drop no rain on it. The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. What sorrow for you who buy up house after house and field after field until everyone is evicted and you live alone in the land. But I have heard Yahweh, the Lord of heaven's armies, swear a solemn oath. Many houses will stand deserted. Even beautiful mansions will be empty. 
Ten acres of vineyard will not produce even six gallons of wine. Ten baskets of seed will, not, uh, will yield only one basket of grain. What sorrow for those who get up early in the morning looking for a drink of alcohol and spend their long evenings drinking wine to make themselves flaming drunk. They furnish wine and lovely music at their grand parties, lyre and harp, tambourine and flute, but they never think about the Lord or notice what He is doing. So my people will go into exile, far away because they do not know me. Those who are great and honored will starve, and the common people will die of thirst. The grave is licking its lips in anticipation, opening its wide its mouth wide. The great and lowly and all the drunken mob will be swallowed up. Humanity will be destroyed and people brought down. Even the arrogant will lower their eyes in humiliation. But Yahweh, the Lord of heaven's armies, will be exalted in him by his justice. The holiness of God will be on display, will be displayed by his righteousness. In that day, lambs will find good pastures and fatten sheep, and strangers will feed among the ruins. What sorrow for those who drag their sins behind them with ropes made of lies, who drag wickedness behind them like a cart. They even mock God and say, Hurry up and do something. We want to see what you can do. Let the Holy One of Israel carry out His plan, for we want to know what it is. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking wine and boast about the alcohol they can hold. They take bribes to let the wicked go free and they punish the innocent. Therefore, just as fire licks up stubble and dry grass shrivels in the flame, so their roots will rot and their flowers wither. For they have rejected the Lord of heaven's armies. They have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. That is why the Lord's anger burns against his people and why he has raised his fist to crush them. The mountains tremble, and the corpses of his people litter the streets like garbage. But even then, the Lord's anger is not satisfied. His fist still proposed to strike. He will send a signal to distant nations far away, and whistle to those at the end of the earth. They will come racing toward Jerusalem. They will not get tired or stumble. They will not stop for rest or sleep. Not a belt will be loose, not a sandal strap broken. Their arrows will be sharp, and their bows ready for battle. Sparks will fly from their hoof horse hoofs, and the wheels of their chariots spin like a whirlwind. They will roar like lions, like the strongest of lions. Growling, they will, produce, they will pounce on their victims and carry them off, and no one will be there to rescue them. They will roar over their victims on the day of destruction, like the roaring of the sea. If anyone looks across the land, only darkness and distress will be seen. Even the light will be darkened by clouds. Lord, thank you for your word and give us wisdom to understand it fully and better and to see how it points to you, King Jesus. In your heavenly name, amen. I was looking at these verses here, and even while reading them, even more imagery was coming to me. Because you know, this, like we picked up from yesterday, the vineyard being trampled down. And, you know, context, yes, this is Isaiah writing to the people of Jerusalem and Judah. The way it applies to us today is because the heart hasn't changed much. The heart of the nations and the heart of the people who lead them, the heart of the fickle way of doing it, often bats back and forth. I mean, Jonah says that all of Nineveh repented. They were still taken out because the repentance didn't exactly keep. It was shallow soil. The seed was planted, but it didn't go very far. Perhaps if it would, maybe Nineveh would still be here. We don't know. And I find it interesting that he's talking about returning a place that he set apart and made beautiful and returning it back to wild and waste. 
you know, and, and from the religious side of reading it, or w one reading of it that I did when I was following religion side of things, and part of why I can't stand it, was looking at it like, oh, well, that's just vengeful and mean and cruel. It's like, well, wait a minute. If you have a vineyard that you've done absolutely everything you can to make it the best for, and it's still a crap vineyard, you have to tear it down. You have to rip it down to the root, uh, sub roots and start going at it again. You don't really get at to the heart of what's going on in the vineyard. You know, in, in a practical vineyard sense, it may be something far deep down in the pH of the soil, and in a heart sense, it's something very deep down in the core of us. That thing that needs to be fixed. I mean, there's a reason that Moses said a circumcision of the heart. For those of you who don't know, circumcision changes the very shape of the thing being circumcised. That's the idea. Not to get overly gross or get down the primrose path of distracted by body parts that are going to be gotten rid of and, trans and changed out with transfiguration anyway, or at the very least, new bodies that are going to be completely different than what we can perceive, fathom, or guess at. So how about focusing on the real fact that it's a heart that needs to be ultimately changed in form, instead of focusing on self to focus on others. You know, Jesus, uh, the Lord says it right there, because Israel decided to turn away, I mean, they were supposed to produce a crop of justice. Nations that are supposed to be built on his foundations, all through the West, all of history, I mean, basically, from Constantine forward, you have different nations that supposedly built themselves up on Christ's foundation, yet every single one of them, there's oppression and cries of violence again and again and again. And they're thrown over and toppled because it's an act of mercy for those who are being oppressed, those who are the victims of the violence. You know, the massive shootouts, the beatings, the overreach, the violence, the basic war in the streets that's going on all across not just America, but North America, South America, basically the entire world. I don't as know, much, uh, know as much in South America other than Venezuela and a couple things there, admittedly, but even watching Europe, yeah. And it's been going nuts and getting nuttier for a while. And it's really easy when looking at the news to go, oh crap, it's the end of the world. And I'm kind of like, well, the world is going to be ending at some point anyway, anyhow, so why do we care? Jesus said he comes as a thief in the night, so be ready. Instead of looking at the signs of the times and going, okay, I need to get right with God because, oh crap. You know, how about we get right with God because we need to be right with God. It's well for those who are counted among the living, those of us who survive, the remnant. Because he always saves his remnant. So why don't we worship the fact that the God of Jacob protects his remnant and deals with injustice and deals with mercy. Like, he is merciful to the victim and he judges the violent one, the violent party. He is a God of justice and mercy. They're two sides of the same coin. If somebody is truly repentant, truly sorrowful for what they did, wanting to do better, then a judgment there is mercy, and the true judgment and just judgment is to be merciful to give them the option, because they have a repentant heart. If there's no repentant heart, well, then justice is to settle the crime. The murderer murdered. Well, we have to deal with that. We can't just let him go running around killing everybody. It's how you end up with bloodletting through the streets. That's how you end up with prison door revolving system. That's how you end up with the situation we're in now. And this isn't pointing the finger at the prisoner. Because Jesus came to set the prisoner free. This is pointing out the fact that the systems are horrifically broken, left, right, and center. And sorry about the camera movement. George is moving around a fair bit. She was chewing on the bamboo earlier, being a silly kitty. You know, I mean, just even the idea that God would just not show, not send rain, that he would just hold back all the provision and just show that when the nation decides, oh yeah, we can do it on our own, what will really happen? You know, the, the fact that uh, one nation under God is no longer in the Pledge of Allegiance last I looked, we have a problem. And it's because we said we were going to be his and then decided not to be. That's cheating. That's adultery. That is, on a national spiritual level, the meme of the couple walking and then the one of them looking back at somebody else. We do it spiritually on the individual level. We do it spiritually on the community level. We do it spiritually on the national level. And of course God's going to be annoyed. 
How many people want to deal with an adulterous mate or an adulterous partner? It sucks. And what's fun to me, not ha-ha fun, but more just showing the infinite mercy and grace of God, is the book of Hosea, where God tells Hosea to go find and marry a promiscuous woman and to ransom her and her dealings and her promiscuity, and he doesn't even know if his kids are his own. But he's supposed to love her anyway and choose her anyway, and God said, because I've chosen you despite the fact that you do this. So even when he brings the justice, and he renders the, guilt, the, the guilty verdict on Judah's crimes, that is not cruelty, that is not coldness, that is not malice. That is a kindness, and it is a justice. I mean, we get bad under shape when, oh, well, they cheated on me, and then they restrained me, and they abused me. Yeah, we do that to God 24-7. We decide our will is better than his own. So it's okay for us to want justice as we define it, but it's not okay for God to deal out justice as he knows it? Talk about eating the wrong fruit. And that's the core of it right there. That's understanding the fact that it's eating the knowledge of good and evil. The people who are up early in the morning and pounding away booze and spending all of their time at grand parties and, and celebrating instead of paying attention to the hurting and the needy. I mean, in today's world, it's no different than Marie Antoinette's Let Them Eat Cake. When we do the same kind of thing, the desperate, the hurting, the poor, the orphan, the widow, the immigrant, the outcast, the other, being made to feel lesser because we refuse to love. That's a problem, and that's the heart that needs to be circumcised so that we truly can love. Because the, the buying up house and field, that's going on today. Check out certain foundation groups. You'll see what I mean. It's kind of concerning. The, everybody being evicted so they live in their own? How many people, especially during the 2020 housing crisis, the 2008 housing crisis, pick a one, where people had more money than cents using and abusing those who wanted the American dream but couldn't do it because of the system that was in their way? So, you have people like Madoff who get rich quicker and abuse those who are in need. And it's a cyclical trend of the nation. God pulling back his fist, winding it up, and giving a quick pop in the mouth, that's earned. The fact that I can list off multiple housing crises within a generation, that requires a pop in the mouth to the nation. And if we repent, maybe God will hold back and relent. And I pray he does. If he doesn't, that's justice to the people who have been screwed left, right, and center. And it was the kind of justice that we need to get a, thought of a clue on and really realize that that's how God is looking at it. You either love others or you don't. You're either His or you're not. Now, is it this way, oh, we get it perfect and exactly right every time? No. The point of grace, the whole repentance, all of it is the fact that God came to set it right between Him and us because the problem is like this. The because the problem is rampant and horrific and a weave of destruction hellfire web that is wild over and swallowed up so many. Our hearts become as open as the empty grave because they're for, we end up in those far from him places. We go nowhere near God and our lives look like hell because of it. And when we start chasing after him, although our lives may look difficult on the outside to others, where our souls matter, what matters in here is getting refined. Because what does a temporal life matter that's only going to live, what, 120 years by Genesis? Sometimes God gives more absolutely we're we really going to fail. Uh, we really, I mean, uh, the short amount of time we get, and we don't want to actually worry or deal with, rather, not worry about, have dealt and have God deal with the parts of us that need to be gotten rid of. The bitterness, the rage, the anger, the discontent, the willingness to walk past those in need, the enjoyment of saying, no, no, it's right for me to buy up my own, uh, I'll buy up all the land. The cruelty that says, no, it's totally okay to behave like the world and ignore everyone in need. Linda says it's okay to throw massive parties and ignore the desperate needy out there. You know? 
And then so when God, like in verses 14 on, talks about the fact that there is going to be justice and that even the haughty will lower their eyes in humiliation, is because God's going to show himself true and right and pure and perfect. And not only does this psalm work for when Jesus returns, it's a promise work for when Jesus returns, it's the beautiful thing about what happens actively in us. Because when a haughty person looks to the Lord and see who's he is, who he is, they lower their eyes in humiliation. I know because I was that person. I was the proud and arrogant person who thought they could walk in and, and just start telling God how to do his job. And it caused me heartache and pain and frustration and sorrow and a lot of problems. And when I started seeing how he does it, how he lives, what he calls justice, my eyes lowered in an instant because I realized I was being the fool. And so not only do you have this promise of the entire world being brought before the king, kneeling down and saying, no, he is God. It's the internal opportunity for us to lay it down, to bend the knee before the cross and realize the ground is level here. We all need him. We can't do it alone. We're not meant to or designed to either. God's nature is other-centric love. Bearing His image, being made in His image, all humanity is, by the way, long before they start actually believing in the second Adam, Jesus. Because the first Adam was made in His image. So, we start living the love that we're shown, we start acting like it, and we start showing people by the way we live that bend the knee before the cross and see that He is making us whole. So that grace is not just a second nature, it's the first nature. That mercy and justice become as naturally as breathing in and out. And what is more important, to love God or love others? What is more important, inhaling or exhaling? What is more important, justice or mercy? What is more important, inhaling or exhaling? And it's God's definition. That's where we lay it down and ask for His wisdom, ask for His discretion, and He gives it to us. Because when we're wandering around with our lives, dragging our sins behind us like a cart, the rope of lies, pretending like we don't have the problem, pretending like we don't have the sin, pretending like we don't have the injury. Now, I'm just going to carry around my baggage and completely ignore the fact that it's slowing me down, breaking my back, and destroying my soul, even though I could just let go of the rope by owning and saying, hey, yeah, I messed up. Do you know the weight of relief that comes when saying, I was the one who made a mistake? Because that, that right there, that sentence and understanding is the first part of repentance. It is turning to God and realizing, wait, I made a mistake. And then not just one of those like, oh, I'm horrible, I'm going to self-flagellate myself now for the sake of religion. But in a legitimate, I need to better. Not, not just an I need to do better, I need better. I need better in here because out there is horrific. So we get to leave our sins, we get to drop the cart, we get to chase after God instead of mo mocking Him. You know, God gives us the opportunity to leave it all behind, to drop it at the cross, to chase Him, to nail our past life to the cross with Him and be given new life. And instead we act and go, Oh, no, 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 no. It's God that's going to wave a magic wand to give me patience. You pray for patience, He's going to give you the opportunity to be patient. You pray for faith, He's going to give you the opportunity to rely on Him more. It is utter dependency on the Lord depending on God. Now when he keeps going through it, the, the sorrow for those who say evil is good, light is dark, bitter is sweet, and vice versa, all the way through, because that is using the apple, the knowledge of good and evil, to define it for ourselves. You know? Evil is evil. Good is good. Call balls and strikes, like we talked last time. Bitter is bitter. Sweet is sweet. Light is light. Dark is dark. The beauty here is that darkness is as day to the Lord. So nothing is hidden from Him. But how can people expect to see the truth of God if we're not willing to call a ball and a strike? If we're not willing to say, yeah, no, that, that situation sucks. So let's pray about it and see what God can do better. Let's ask Him how He's going to use us to make it better. 
In surrendering relationship to him, we get to walk out the garden and in his intimate relationship with him as sovereign king. It's all the work of his hand. And so when God says that he's going to lick up and destroy the strangers and get rid of the roots of these things, we want that. We want the root of these evil things gone. Try getting rid of morning glory. You want the root gone. Otherwise, it just keeps coming back. You know, the flowers withering, the flowers, the painting, of oh, this is our display of beauty. No. The world's beauty is ugly. The world's, oh, the California is the best state in the world. And then why are there hundreds of thousands of homeless people? Just as an example, and that's not even trying to pick on California. I could do it for any state in the Union. And almost every major city, too. In the entire Western world. And that's the part that hurts most. Because it could be done. For most of the Western world. You know, and God's prompting me before we had time to talk about verse 17, about the fat and sheep. This is, the NLT says young goats will feed among the ruins. I like the Hebrew of the and strangers. Because all of this to me is the wedding invitation. You know, the wedding invitation to Judah and Israel and then, then, then the West and now, and it's to everybody, the whole world. Come to Jesus as King. And the invitation is there. It's whether or not we're actually going to party at the wedding. Because this is people from all over the world coming and celebrating. Yeah, it may be the ruins of the world, but it is God going to take care of it. Taking care of every need from the sparrows to us. He sees to it all, so we trust that He is sovereign. Because He is going to deal with it, and we want Him to. How many nations, how many states, how many cities, how many towns have streets littered with human beings? Gang violence, cop, all of it. The blood is running through our streets. We need justice. We long for it. And so, when God deals with it and then sends an invading nation to go deal with the rest, that's justice. That's mercy. That's a kindness to the victims. That's a kindness to those who have been destroyed by the system is most of these people who are going to be pounced on and taken out by the armies are the ones who have been doing the pressing and the taking out. The oppressors getting a taste of their own medicine, as it were. Which is kind of the very reason gone in the wrong direction. I mean, just for a moment, right? Getting a taste of their own medicine. Now let's go in the opposite direction and look at grace. Why would God rescue an army of slaves? Because they knew what it was like to live in bondage. Instead of loving others and living without the bond, not putting out chains, they shackle them on, they become oppressors. And the cycle repeats itself as it does to this day. We were slaves once. Slaves to sin, slaves to death, slaves to hell, slaves to the grave. The Lord has rescued us. So why don't we show the mercy that He has shown us? Because without Him, there is no life. Without Him, there is no hope. Without Him, there is no light. We are saved by grace. That's the whole point. I look forward to seeing you guys next week, God willing, as we pick up with chapter 6, which for the longest time I treated as Isaiah chapter 1 just because of the whole unclean lips. But I look forward to getting into it. I'll see you then. May His favor be upon you and know that you're loved.